I think having gratitude for where you're at in the process is so valuable because like, you know, I can have true gratitude for where we're at right now, meaning I'm glad that our business isn't bigger than it is right now. I'm glad that it's not smaller. I'm glad that we're right where we're at. I'm learning the lessons I'm learning. I'm learning about, uh, you know, certain types of leadership and roles and firing people and doing everything that I'm learning right now. I would only learn in this phase. Welcome back to the Beyond the Wealth podcast. Today's episode is with Braven Grant. Braven Grant has had an extremely interesting journey that I had the pleasure of diving into, and I'm excited for you all to get to hear it as well. Braven, thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, dude. I'm excited to be out here. I'm excited to be in Miami, and thanks for having me on. Yeah, I'm happy Casey was able to connect us because I know you're here just for a short period. I think yeah. you're here just today, and then you're popping up to Orlando. Yeah. So I appreciate uh, you making some time to do this. For sure, man. Excited. So I had the pleasure of doing research on you and and <laughs> learning about your story, and it is definitely one that you would say is very inspiring. You were put in situations where you could have easily gone hard the other way, <laughs> yeah. but now you're here in Miami on a podcast talking about all of the successes you have. So kudos to you for creating that si- or dealing with that situation and creating the person you are now. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. I think statistically i uh am much more likely to be in jail than making millions of dollars so i'll I'll take it (laughs) yeah right i think i think that's a good uh i think (laughs) this one's better than that one yeah so my first question is what does being called a dreamer mean to you Mm, dang man i like that question (laughs) um i think like growing up i was always called a dreamer um but I think it was usually teachers saying it in a negative light. Yeah. And I, I don't know. I don't know that I ever felt embarrassed by it. Uh, but I definitely, there was times where I felt a little bit like, um, am I just, am I just being a dreamer? Like, yeah. but in the negative context, like, am I just pretending is I guess what I would ask myself. And, uh, at the more I've grown up, I'm not very old, but like the more I've just accepted who I am and I've leaned into that. I mean, I really have created like so many of the things that I've dreamed about and continue to dream about or set as visions, if you want to call it visions or vision boards or whatever, like I just consistently knock those things down. And, uh, so to me, like being a dreamer is just someone who says like, yeah, it might be crazy and it might sound crazy to everyone else, but I'm just going to try and do it anyway. And I think for me, it's like, that's the funnest thing I, I could, that's the most fun I could have in life anyways, is just trying to chase those things. Even if I didn't get them or I don't achieve them. That is just like living your life that way, really. Yeah. And that was one of the things that caught the most attention to me when watching some of your prior interviews was something similar that a lot of entrepreneurs that are successful have. And it's something that I feel like has come up on the last like four episodes is an entrepreneur typically has delusional Mm self-confidence and these crazy ideas that they think of or, or that they, that become their baby. Yeah. And, being a dreamer is such a simple way to say it, but Mm -hmm. that is such a core part of being an entrepreneur. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, my partner's here in the room as well. Uh, my my partner in business, I always (laughs) like want to clarify that. Like I have a (laughs) wife at home, a business partner anyways. Um, but like we grew up in a super small town and we always say that like, you know, we, there was 2,500 people in our town. There's 200 people in our whole high school. My graduating class was like 40 something people or maybe right at 50, Anyway, but like, I really think we were like delusional enough to think we could do it because we were just like in our own little like world in the small town. And, you know, we didn't really have, we didn't really have these like good examples of super successful people, but we didn't have any examples of people trying and failing really either. Yeah. And, uh, one of my friends, Kevin, just, he has like a slogan. It's like stupid enough to try. And I, it's like how I feel like we were just stupid enough to try and I, I like our first year in business, I got this like neon sign that says like billion dollar impact. And I was like, we're going to build a billion dollar brand. And I had no idea. Like I didn't even know what a million dollars lo- would look like, but a billion was just like, yeah, let's do it. You know, we were just stupid enough to try. And, and, and I think it's important to have that, especially in the beginning, because starting a business, there's so much, uh, complexity and difficulty, especially in like the startup phase, like first year of a business that, uh, if you knew all that was intel, it was going to be in, intel inside that journey, you, none of us would probably really do it until you're just in it and you're like, 
well, I guess we got to figure it out, you know? Yeah, I was just having a conversation with a guest, I think it was Saturday, and we were talking about how, like, if you go off of social media for what being an entrepreneur is or entrepreneurship, it looks like the best thing you could possibly do. Yeah. And, like, you can work from wherever you want, <laughs> you're in Bali, and you're making millions of dollars on the computer. That's just not the case. Like, one day you think your company's going under, the next day you think you're the man on the moon. Yeah. And, like all of these different things. And I think it's interesting to to think about for you specifically, because like you just mentioned, you guys were in this small town. Mm -hmm. There wasn't too many examples of failure or like, or even a success on like, yeah. what's really successful. How much do you think things have changed now with social media? Like that small town person is able to see almost mm -hmm. anything that they want now, where back when you were at that age, that wasn't mainstream yet. Yeah. Man, I, well, I think honestly, like, there's a lot of good that comes from that, right? Like, to see, uh, you see Grant Cardone in this in Jets, and you're like, no, oh, maybe I could do that too, right? Or like, you just see these people who have made it, and you're like, okay, maybe I could do that too. I think also, though, a lot of the people that I know work for me or that I've like mentored or helped that are young or around my age or younger than me, it also can be a struggle because the way it's painted is, is very much like, oh, I should already be there. Yeah. And, uh, or, man, they got there so fast. Or you hear these stories about a brand that goes from like zero to a hundred million or zero to a billion. And you're like, man, why am I, why do I suck? Right. Why, why can't I go faster? Um, and so like in some lights, I think it's really good. But then I think also you have to be able to kind of detach yourself from a lot of that. Cause one, like it's social media, it's not all as real as people think. And two, like, I think having gratitude for where you're at in the process is so valuable because like, you know, I can have true gratitude for where we're at right now, meaning I'm glad that our business isn't bigger than it is right now. I'm glad that it's not smaller. I'm glad that we're right where we're at. I'm learning the lessons I'm learning. I'm learning about, uh, you know, certain types of leadership and roles and firing people and doing everything that I'm learning right now. I would only learn in this phase. So if I get too stuck and like, oh, I wish we were at a hundred million already, you know, I would miss out on the lessons here. And so being willing to like enjoy the process, realize it takes time and uh you know not get stuck in the comparison of like dang that guy's already at 100 that guy's already at 200 uh i think makes the process a lot more enjoyable and not just like an endless hamster wheel yeah that's a very powerful way to put it and i i live in like one of the meccas of <laughs> fake on yeah, fake yeah, on yeah. the outside nothing real at all and you would think that some of these people are the wealthiest people in the world yeah but they're living paycheck to paycheck and and barely scraping by yeah and i i respect that you're able to not compare because that's the toughest part when you get social media you see other people like it's always like that like oh when i get 10 million i'll be happy when i get <laughs> 50 million i'll be happy when i get 100 million i'll be happy yeah Every time you're not fulfilled and it's like, oh, well, this person's making a hundred. I want to be like that person. Yeah, exactly. So it's like being able to balance that. And like you said, just be grateful for where you are right now in your yeah. journey because they're all different. That's a very powerful state. Yeah. And I'm not perfect at it. So, I mean, <laughs> thanks for the compliment. And I like, we still all do it, but I think it's reminding ourselves, realizing that and um, yeah, finding ways to enjoy right where you're at. I mean, I had a mentor early on first time I had to fire someone I was like meltdown about it it was one of my close friends as well because I was from a town of 2,500 people so I already knew everyone that mm -hmm. everyone that worked for me I knew him and uh how to let like let them go and I just had this huge conversation and he was like man how lucky are you that at 20 I think it was like 20 or 21 that at 21 years old you get to be ha having these conversations that you get to be going through having to learn how to fire someone and, and have this tough these tough things and so that perspective really helped me be like, okay, I'm, I really am grateful to be right where I'm at in this moment, learning what I'm getting to learn. So, yeah, no. And, and that's so true. Like getting those moments are so invaluable at an early stage in your life where people are like, oh, well, I'll learn that when I'm 30 or 35. You being able to say, well, I experienced all that in my early twenties. Yeah. Anything you throw at me from here on out is not going to knock me off my horse or, or catch mm -hmm. me by surprise. That is like very unique. Yeah. Not that many people have gotten a business to that far at that young of an age where yeah. they're firing somebody or having me, mm -hmm. not even firing, just being faced with that decision of like, man, this is somebody I know, but the best business decision here is to let them go. 
Yeah. That's a lot of maturity. Yeah. Most 21, 22 year olds would be like, you know what? I'm just going to keep them on. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't want to let them down. Like, I'm just going to keep pushing forward. And, and that's not the right thing to do in the context of the business. Yeah. And probably for them as well. But Yeah. Right. <laughs> so you're younger. You have your father who had started a business mm-hmm. who is impactful to you at a young age. I even think I heard you say that when you were younger, he was reading you books at night and it wasn't your typical lullaby or like <laughs> yeah. children's book. It was think and grow rich, rich, poor, rich dad, poor dad, yeah. books like that. Do you remember those moments early on in your life? Like, yeah. do you remember things that you heard? Cause it's, I was thinking about that and I was like, man, it must've been interesting. Like the way that we would interpret that message now is much different than you would interpret it as a younger child. What from that time do you remember and like what really stuck to you? Yeah, I, man. Um, yeah, I think that as a kid, I didn't realize how unique it was. Like I was like, oh, this is dad, you know, like yeah. there's and, and, and as a kid, when I say as a kid, it's funny, like he would read to us when I was like 16 years old, <laughs> like we would have like family reading that. So, um, yeah, it was like when I was little and he was reading it to us like a like a book you would read to a child. But it was these, you know, more uh, self-development type books. But then also like all the way up growing up, we would read together or he would pay us ten dollars for a book if we finished it that's smart um yeah and and i think like the thing that stuck with me the most from that uh truthfully is like just the art of learning just the art of having mentors and finding you know people ahead of you to learn like i was literally texting with my dad the other day and uh he sent me something about one of my mentors and and i said you know dad like i think 100 percent of any quote-unquote success i've had has 100% come just by getting the right people to help. Like, I don't think I'm an expert really at any particular piece of the business. Like, I'm not the perfect media buyer. I'm not a perfect branding guy. I'm not a perfect sales guy. I'm not perfect. Like, I'm not the best at, I would say, any individual piece, but I've been really good at getting people who are really good at those things or who are the best, asking them for help, and then just helping us build out the system. I think when you're able to do that, um, you can just move so much more quickly than trying to figure it out yourself or trying to become an expert at everything yourself. Um, cause like there's, there's value in having high, high leverage skills. Um, but the value, the leverage on that skill, uh, starts to diminish over time. Like, yeah, you, maybe you could get yourself to a couple hundred thousand a year, or maybe you could get yourself to a million on like one skill, like sales or something like that. But it's like the combination is where you really start to find leverage of like that you can make jumps of multiple millions at a time. And uh, I think that's the biggest thing I took away from my dad is in that time of learning is just to be a student in that way and always be seeking out like, you know, whether it's from books or from mentors or whoever it is, uh, ways to kind of get ahead through through knowledge. And I want to double tap on something that you mentioned there because it's it comes up regularly of delegation being Mm -hmm. able to equip people who are experts in a certain field that you've identified is not your expertise and allowing them to help you be successful. Mm -hmm. That is something that entrepreneurs across the board struggle with Yeah, because you always think, Oh, but I I can do a better job. Like Mm -hmm. I want to do it the way I want to do it. What advice would you have to the person listening right now who's struggling with delegation and they might not even know, but it's holding them back immensely Mm -hmm. in their business my advice is you have to do it like um i remember so when we first started the company it was basically just me then i got married and it was me and my wife so i would answer every customer service chat i would uh fulfill all the orders the five a day that we had i would write notes on the orders like just everything like i just kind of did all of it and i remember uh caleb actually was like one of our first team members and um and even though he came out to help us with marketing he was still learning that stuff and I was like, okay, I'm going to have you start taking customer service responses and stuff um, so that I can delegate this thing. That's what I'm like, my coaches are telling me I have to do. And I remember like, even though Kay was amazing and like super personal and human, personable human, I'd be like, dang, I would have said this different in that chat. And I would have said this different. Uh, man, I wish you would have said this in that email. And uh, so I understand like how difficult it is, but it's laughable to me now thinking how concerned I was about all of those little details when if I had if I was still inside of that doing all of those little things 
I mean, we wouldn't even be, we probably wouldn't even be able to be doing a million a year right now, let alone, you know, eight figures and beyond. Like we have a whole team of customer service reps now and a leader of have those customer service reps and all that. And so uh, that first step is scary, but you just, you just have to do it and be aware that things are going to break. Things aren't going to look exactly how you wanted them when you did it or whatever. And you just get to see those things, put system behind them, improve them, um, you know, find a better person or whatever it is to, to fix those things. But I mean, if you want to grow, like it's just a bandaid that has to get ripped off and you got to just say like, Hey, I'm bringing someone in. They're going to do this thing. Maybe your income has to go down for a time because you got to spread out that, uh, the revenue to now bring in someone to help. But then over time you're going to like, you know, way outpace what you're going to do by yourself. Like you just can't, it just depends, I guess, on your goals. If you want to have like a small thing that brings in some aside cash, it's probably fine. But if you want to build something of like meaningful enterprise value there's no one doing that solo like, yeah no one that's the best like the solopreneurship that whole movement that they have hired 15 vas overseas <laughs> they're doing, like everything yeah but it's like i'm a solopreneur like i'm the only one in my business yeah that that's just not the case it, this doesn't work it's yeah. just it's it's like physically almost impossible unless you've got a just yeah it's just not possible yeah <laughs> so i do want to keep the conversation very focused on you and your journey but I do want to give people context on your journey. Mm -hmm. You had a very tough childhood, to say the least, with your mom passing away at an early age, your dad building this company, and then having legal issues due to that, and then bouncing back from that. I don't want to go on and, and do the whole thing, but I do want people to hear that part of your story so that when we touch on the success yeah. you've had, they can go back and be like, damn, well, if he yeah. was able to do it, I, I can go do it too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the super short version of it. Um, and like, you know, there's some other podcasts I've done where we've told the whole story. So if anyone's curious, you can do that. But really, like my mom passed away when I was three. Uh, when I was five, my dad, uh, uh, a case opened up against him. Um, basically, some people thought that he had something to do with my mom passing. That went on for about five years, that whole, the trial in that case. And then he got sentenced to five years in prison for manslaughter. Basically, they said he didn't do enough to save her. Uh, this like whole thing and, you know, not to get into it, but basically from my sixth grade year through the end of my sophomore year, uh, my dad was in prison. He had built a company before that and basically, you know, lost everything we had, like, you know, all of our cars, like all the nice things we had our house was foreclosed, the building that our, his business was in, you know, lost that. Ended up moving with my grandma, like basically lost all of the success and, and things that he had created for our family and for his life, um, during that time period. And then, uh, yeah. And then he was, you know, gone for those five years and, uh, we still got to visit him and stuff like that, but you know, it was a very different, uh, childhood for sure. Yeah. And what was your mindset during that period? Because what that was what you said, sixth grade through eight, tenth grade? Yeah, sixth grade through the end of my sophomore year. So I guess I was like 10 to 10 to 15 ish or like to 16, somewhere in that yeah, somewhere range. range. Yeah. What were you like mentally at that point? Like, how tough was that on you? Um, <laughs> I guess and that's kind of, yeah, I know it's hard. It's actually hard a little bit to truly know what was real about how I felt then because now I have like such a I would say positive perspective of the that experience in my life because I truly believe it's in a lot of ways created so much opportunity for me um from the sense of like I'm 25 and I there's a lot of people who put a lot of trust and faith in me I think just because I've been through so much already that there's a level of um I don't know, just like maybe certainty that I just exude or I don't know what it is, but I've just been through some hard shiz. And so people will like, trust me, I guess. So like, there's so much value I see in it now. And even, you know, the relationship I have with my dad, the relationship I have with my family, that a lot of it came during that time of like having to be together and fight together. Um, that I, like it's, it's funny. I see it in truly such a, a positive perspective. It's hard for me to understand fully like how difficult it was as a child but I can think back at like moments where I was like broke down like in the middle of my sixth grade classroom you know because like I don't know just the weight of it and looking at my friends and knowing like they were just they had their dad to go talk to after school and that I was going to go to my buddy's house and his dad was going to take us out paintballing or doing whatever right and it was like man like 
the weight of those moments was insanely heavy. Um, I had a lot of hate, like tons of hate for the people that I felt caused that in my life. Um, but I do think ultimately like the thing that my dad instilled in us during all that was like, we are going to continue to live our lives. We're going to continue to have this, like not have this moment define us, but how we respond to it define us. And I think through that, like pretty much anything I go through is kind of like, well, we'll figure it out. Like yeah. we went to make it, we were like $2 million in debt at, during that time. And, you know, my dad's climbed out of that. He's rebuilt a really successful business of his own. You know, uh, before that, I think he had like an eight figure business, like maybe doing like around 10 million. Now, like we both have $10 million businesses. We both have like created all the things that we had before times more, you know? And so I'm like, well, like, I, I really don't think we're going to get worse off than that. And so I, I have a, I think a little bit of extra resilience from that. And so I'm grateful for, uh, I wouldn't ask to go through it again, yeah. but I'm grateful for it, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I think it makes perfect sense. And it's very mature of you as a 25-year-old because someone's like, oh, he's 25. That's still young relative to a lot of other people <laughs> in the industry, in the, in business. And for you to be able to look back and quickly identify the positives mm -hmm. of what it came from that and, and how it's impacted your life is amazing. Because look, I, there's definitely people listening who are going through stuff People go through hard times, but like your dad said, the way that you bounce back, the way that you answer is really the important mm -hmm. part of that. And my mom always told me something. It's not about how you start. It's always how you finish. Yeah. And it's amazing that your dad has been this kind of rock to you this whole time. And yeah. like, what a good example for him to get out, get out of debt, bounce back and build another successful mm -hmm. company. Like I think about you, like how could you not have built a ten million dollar business like after having an example like that? Yeah, no, it's I mean it's uh, the the proof of who uh, my dad is uh, to me is is so evident just by looking at his life, like the fruits of who he is, right? And I think the, the Bible right says like you'll know them by their fruits, mm -hmm. um, and I've always kind of like had a little bit of a chip on my shoulder of like, well, one I want people to see what a good man he is by me being his fruit as like a child. Yeah. Right. That like he raised me, but also you just like looking at his life is, yeah. I mean, it's massively inspired me and he's my first and probably largest mentor, uh, even to this day, you know? So, yeah, no, it's, it's amazing. So when did business start to become an obsession of yours? Like how old are you where it's like, you know what? I want to go and build a business and I'm going all in on making sure that happens. Yeah. I think I always wanted to be an entrepreneur, like in elementary school, you know, like they would ask you what you want to do or whatever. And I was like, I just want to make money. It was like being the NBA or like make millions of dollars and fly around on a private jet. Like <laughs> I just kind of had that, like it's one or the other. Yeah. Uh, I guess that was the thing that, you know, people called me a dreamer for. And so I always knew I wanted to, uh, but I didn't know what that meant or really looked like. And, uh, you know, once I, I had started this business, like I was like 17 with my with help of my dad and my brother, we kind of all did it together. This was like right after he got home from prison and, uh, it was more of a hobby, but once I got married, uh, and I was like still in college at the time and we were kind of running this business on the side, that's when I realized like, Oh, I got to figure out how to provide for a family. And I really don't want to go work for someone. Um, so I just got to figure this out. And then I think it just, you know, it became a little bit of a game. Like once it could provide income for me, like once I was making like 2,500 bucks a month and that was like enough to survive as a 19 year old, you know, newlywed kid. I was like, now it just feels like a game and this is fun. And what more, what other game could I play that, that would have an infinite runway and like infinite opportunities and problems to solve. And just, um, yeah, I think it's just like the process of it all has become really fun and exciting for me. Yeah. And, you just mentioned you were married at 19. Mm -hmm. Most people listening would be like, man, that's really early. Um, I just got engaged recently. I'm getting ready for that stage in my life. And it's been one of getting engaged was one of like the most amazing experiences I've ever had. How much did getting married early and having a strong partner by you like impact the success that you've had? Yeah. I think that's something very unique. I haven't had anybody on the show that's gotten married that early. Yeah. Um, you know, I always say like, you know, people, a lot of people I hear talk about, oh, you know, like 
I don't want to get married until I'm successful or like, I want to like, you know, use this time that I'm single to get successful and all that. And like, not that I think that that's completely wrong. I will say though, for me and my experience, being married, having a partner in life has been massively impactful to me being able to be successful. Like I made a post the other day. I was just saying like, instead of, you know, being out on a Friday night chasing ass, like I already got laid and it's 10 PM and I get to go to bed. Right. Like, <laughs> And that's like, hilarious. that's a big factor for me is like yeah. my, my wife, like she's amazing. And, and her role in our relationship and our business really is like take care of our home and our kids and our, our life. And then I get to go and like focus on, on business and producing and making money. And to me, one, it's a huge driver. Like it was hard for me to truly be motivated, uh, at the same level before I got married. Cause it kind of was just like, yeah, it'd be fun to make money, but yeah. there wasn't really a true purpose behind it but like now i'm like i want to build a life for my family i want to say you know be able to, yeah i need to <laughs> and like the family the life i want to create for my kids is is not a life that you would get from making fifty thousand dollars a year so uh it's been i would say for me massively impactful to my success uh whereas i think a lot of people are afraid of it because they don't want it to to be a distraction or get in the way of their success but if you have a partner and you're on the same page and you create a vision together i mean now you have it's just like a business. Now you have a team and you have, you know, a way to get to those goals faster. Yeah, no. And I think that's amazing. And that's exactly the way that I think of it. Like I was with my significant other for five years. Now we're getting engaged. It's someone I've known almost my whole life. Yeah. Like having her around in that time of going through my sneaker businesses, failing, mm -hmm. getting back up, starting this, like getting jobs. I don't know if I would be able to stay the course without somebody holding me accountable and like kind of keeping me in line. So I, that's, that's amazing. And, and yeah. congratulations for that because that, that's very unique and, and amazing. And I hope people that listen understand that because a lot of the people that sit in that chair or that sit in other podcast chairs, it's like, you gotta be single. You gotta grind it out. Like, so I love that perspective. Yeah. I remember, I, I think if I remember right, the first kind of stab at it was uh, a creatine that you went to an expo with mm -hmm. maybe your brother and somebody else and you sold a thousand units over yeah. the weekend. Like what, what was that moment? Talk about that. Yeah. So, I mean, we, that was us like launching the company and actually it wasn't even an LLC yet. So, um, yeah, like I don't even know where that revenue got <laughs> tracked or anything like the IRS shouldn't audit it, but anyways, yeah, so it was like, but, um, yeah, we we had we had discovered I discovered instantized creatine, um, the, the creator of of the you know this revolutionary new way to produce creatine, so it was hundred percent soluble, um, and basically he gave us like a super limited exclusive on it, and was like, you know, I think it was like through the end of that year, like we could try it out and see if we could sell it, and then they would give you know maybe extend the exclusive to us to be the manufacturer for that in the U.S. and. Uh, we took a thousand bags to the Arnold Classic, which is a uh, you know big fitness expo, and that was it was like a thirty hour drive from Pima, and you know two of my friends and you know uh, some other people that just were you know part of it to help us put it together, and, and we just we sold out all the bags. And I think for me it was like oh wow like there's really something here. I didn't, I don't think I fully grasped it. Yet. I was only seventeen, and and the company has like evolved so much since then. But I at least knew. Hey, we could really do this. And to me, I just wanted to be there. Like truthfully, I didn't have like super grandiose ideas of like what the brand would mean or how, what impact we could create. It was more like, man, I want to be in those rooms. I was super into fitness at the time. And it was like Steve Cook and Christian Guzman and Jeremy Buendia and these guys. I was like, man, I want to get in the room with them. And we were there and we were in the room and we could, we made enough money to stay in the room. And I was like, this is cool. I want to keep doing this. And, and that was like really what started us off. So. And then you put that on pause for a little bit, right? There was like that in between mm -hmm. period where it did well, didn't really act on it and keep it going. And then I think you mentioned 2020 is yeah. when shit got real and you started to actually go all in on this brand. Yeah. Talk about that moment and for anybody listening, give them a quick pitch on what this brand is. We keep talking about your brand, eight figures, your brand. What is yeah, the yeah. brand and, and, and what was that part where you said, you know what, let's go all in. Like this is yeah. what we're doing. Yeah, so I mean, the the brand's gains in bulk. Um, we're probably potentially going over some into some rebranding of the name this year, but uh, you know, gains we we sell high performance supplements for you know 
increasing human performance, whether in the gym and people's lives, whatever it might be. It's all, you know, natural whole food uh, based, you know, we don't use synthetic flavors, sweeteners, any of that stuff. But, um, you know, the essence of the company at the beginning was we were just going to sell bulk, clean, pure, raw ingredients. Um, and we've really evolved and grown into serving our customers in a higher way uh, over the years. But that was what it was at the start. And it was more of like this hobby thing to like try and like meet some of my, the people I thought were so cool and whatnot. And, um, but in 2020 I was married, the, the business was making money like 20 to 30,000 a month, but it wasn't making money. Like I wasn't getting paid. No one was getting paid. Like it was just enough to pay for the next round of product and sell that. And they just like kind of keep cycling that way. And, uh, I was having to sell door to door to make enough money to live my life and now pay for, you know, me and my wife to live and go to college. And so at that point, I, I just got done selling door to door for, for a summer. And I was like, I really don't want to go do that again. So I basically have between now and next summer to figure this thing out. And, uh, it, April was when I would have had to sign the contract to go out and sell again. And, and another company had offered me a deal and it was like a really good deal. Like it would have made me good money. And, uh, so I told them that I was like, okay, hey, yeah, like you gotta get me till basically April 1st to decide, like, I'm going to see if I can figure this thing out first. And it was in March of that year. I think we did our first like $60,000 a month. And then in April we did like 120,000 and it was like, we like sold out all of our inventory and like got backed up and it was this whole crazy thing. But it was like, wow, like there's really something here. And so I was like, Hey, yeah, I'm not coming out. I'm not going to sell the order anymore. And, and. Uh, we're going to pursue this. And I think the shift was really, Hey, I'm going to figure out business, Mm -hmm. not just, I'm going to start a supplement company or I'm going to like sell supplements. It was like, I got to figure out business marketing, like structure, like how do we actually build a a business of value? And, and that shift and getting mentors and stuff as well really is what took us from just petering along to really, you know, doing something. So. Yeah, that was actually my follow up. Like, what what, what clicked? Mm-hmm. When took you from twenty to sixty to a hundred plus? Yeah, <laughs> like, what changed in that period of time? I was like, this is what we need to continue doing. Yeah, uh, you know, I one I had a mentor who had who had a company. I think they were doing, his company was doing like a hundred, maybe like one hundred fifty thousand a month. So he was like in that range, and so he kind of knew at least a little bit of the path to get there. Um, paid him basically like all the money I had to teach us like what he had done um and so that was really helpful but i think like you know strategy wise the two biggest things was offer and math Mm -hmm. like truly understanding what's the math of of this business like hey if we want to go out and acquire a customer how much do we have available to go acquire a customer can we spend 20 dollars to acquire a customer okay how do we build you know the offer and the product offering in a way that would allow us to go get customers for 20 dollars? and so understanding the math of it but then also making an offer that uh, was irresistible and made sense and really shifting from, Hey, we're selling creatine to really selling um, the offer of what we were providing, which was, you know, a product that could really help people improve their performance mentally, physically, you know, across the board in their lives. And so recreating the offer, providing more value in the offer and then understanding the math together, I think is what allowed us to kind of like quickly get over some humps and like move scale quickly and continue to scale from there is like i hated math in high school but when it comes to math around money uh it seems to be a little bit more enjoyable (laughs) yeah math with a dollar sign is always better than math with no dollar sign (laughs) you mentioned mentors a lot you mentioned on other podcasts yeah how important is it for younger entrepreneurs or people i don't want because some entrepreneurs are, are not younger anybody wanting to get into business or start a business how important is seeking mentorship and how immense is the value that they can get? Uh, to me, it, I mean, to me is everything. Like, I think if you're under like, I don't know, I, I think at any level, but especially if you're like, have not gained traction yet, like, I think it's absolutely crucial. And I think it's tough because there are a lot of people uh, who hear, you know, I'm out here promoting a message of you need to get a mentor. I don't coach. Like you can't pay me to coach you. Yeah. Like I don't do that um, currently. And uh, like I've consulted a few people here and there, but I'm not saying that to serve myself. Like I'm saying that hopefully to serve someone who's watching, who is like on the edge and, and needs a mentor. Unfortunately, there are people who, who take advantage of that. But here's like the thing I'll even say about that. I've been a part of some terrible masterminds, some terrible coaching experiences 
where the only thing I got out of them was like meeting one new person or one other thing or had one little thing click. And I still look back and realize like, man, that one thing I took from that was, was life changing for my business. And so I think the reason I've had such good success with mentorship, one, I've had good mentors, but I actually think more importantly, I've been a good student. Like I show up to coaching, I show up to, to masterminds, I show up to events going, I'm going to extract something out of this. It's going to change things for us. And I think a lot of people show up to coaching, mentorship, masterminds going, I think this is a scam and I'm going to prove that it's a scam. I'm going to prove it wasn't worth my money. I'm going to try and get my money back. It's like, if you show up that way, you're probably not going to get anything out of it, but you could have like a dog shit mentor and you could just show up like, I'm going to get something out of this. I'm going to extract something out of this. And just the time that you're setting aside to work on yourself, that alone will be worth whatever you invested. So, you know, there's, there's a whole thing around it. You should seek out good mentors. And I would say the biggest thing to look for is try and find someone who actually has done the thing you want. Um, and, and so finding good mentors is really crucial. And even if they're not great though, like show up as a great student and, and you'll still be able to extract something out of it. Because I just think it's, it's the fastest path. Do you have to have a mentor? No, there's a lot of people probably who have gone to some level of success without like a direct coach or without paying coaches. Maybe they just networked into the right people. Um, but it is a shortcut. Like you, you will definitely move faster. Like we went 20, 60, 120, And then within six months, we're at like 400,000 a month directly off of things that we were learning from mentors. So we could have probably got to where we're at today, you know, and beyond without that, it just would have took probably who knows how long, two to three more years. And we probably would have quit somewhere in there because we wouldn't have figured it out and be like, all right, this isn't working. Let's stop. Yeah. So, going from one going from 60 to 120 to 400 what broke and, or what i mean maybe a good question is what didn't break but yeah what are some of the challenges because i know scaling everybody thinks it's like oh it's so amazing like the business is at four hundred thousand a month some people don't understand some people actually liked when the business was at 120 a month yeah. but not at that 400 what were some of the challenges you faced scaling a company so fast uh inventory is the biggest i mean we have had like we've almost lost the business a couple of times. I mean, we just, so we did our first million dollar months. just like in like the last six months. And uh, again, like had huge inventory issues come up where it's like, man, we weren't ready for that. We weren't ready for that. And, and not even though we weren't ready. It's like, you also deal with issues of cash. Like, okay. Like you have to outlay the cash in advance. And then when COVID was happening, you know, that was right when we were starting to scale. Well, that was also right when supply chain issues were happening where boats couldn't get across the ocean some of our main suppliers coming out of Mongolia and China, like we weren't able to get our stuff. And so we were like scaling super, super fast. And then like going out of stock for two months. And, and the, the really scary thing about that is like, if you get comfortable, like, let's say like when our run rate for, you know, a while, like, okay, we've done now a few months at a hundred thousand, a few months at 300,000, a few months at whatever your fixed expenses go up too. your team grows, your, you know, you may be getting into a bigger building, you're, you're spending more money on software and all of these different things. Well, when sales drop, you still have all those same people. When sales drop, you're still in that same building space. Like, so those things don't change. And so that can get really scary for, for a company when you're scaling really fast. And so, you know, we've been able to get better access to capital now that where you've been in business for a few years and, um, you know, we have some credibility behind us and stuff, but as a 20, one-year-old kid no one was giving me a line of credit no one was like we were scrounging it together getting like credit cards like with my dad and like other people to try and like be connected to our business so we'd have access to some capital for ad spend and we were spending like we've always been so aggressive like <laughs> like even in november of this last year like we spent all of our profit basically on ads because we were like frick it like we just want to grow like that's all we you know not all we want we all want to make money too but like our major focus is how do we grow this thing? And so uh, that was the most frustrating part was just like never having enough capital, never having enough uh, inventory to grow at the speed we wanted. Like if if we would have had a couple million dollars in cash in 2020, we would probably be four or five times the size we are now because uh, the way Facebook was then, how easy it was, uh, we just never had the inventory or cash to be able to go as fast as we wanted, so... Hey, everything happens for a reason. Yeah. So maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe we're right. grateful for the spot I'm in. Right? Yeah, right. <laughs> grateful for the spot you're in. Um, so, what's your relationship with subscriptions? Mm -hmm. I mean, subscriptions had a, a big 
part yeah. to play in your journey, but take yeah. us through the time where you were in subscription and then you added a subscription and what that did for your business. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, when it comes to scale, that was one of the biggest factors that allowed us to, I would say, hit a new level of scale. It fixed a lot of our supply chain struggles. It fixed a lot of our cash flow struggles, like because now we had some consistency and 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 things like that. Our profitability skyrocketed. Like our EBITDA in the last year and a half's gone up like an obnoxious amount because of subscription. Um, I don't know why. Like I think uh, it, I think everything's like this, right? Like podcasts. It's like oh, it's too late to start a podcast. Like they've all been started, or it's too late to start like my personal brand on Instagram or whatever, right? Um, I felt like uh, it was too late to get into the subscription game. It was like, everyone's doing that. Everyone's been doing the box thing. We tried to do a box at one point, it didn't really work. And, uh, you know, or we didn't figure it out. And so I had this like weird feeling about it. Like, no, people don't even like that. People, it's probably a bad experience. And then uh, I had a mentor who was just like, dude, like if you don't have a subscription, you don't have a business. And then I saw, he had said that. And then uh, me and my partner were watching like, uh, uh, AG one just like got evaluated at like 1.2 billion. And we were like, what the hell? Like, it's crazy. this is insane, you know? And so we're like, one day a mentor basically told me like, you need to do it. Like you just need to like rip the bandaid off. So we drive, we were driving like probably at the time, like two to $3,000 of ads a day. And we were like, just redirected 100% of traffic to a new page that was subscription focused. And we were just like, all right, like we're going to risk it and just see if it works. And that night we were like texting each other every time a purchase came through on subscription. We're like, dude, is this like working? Like, huh. dude, this is really working. Like, I think this is like the best test we've ever ran. I think it's working, you know, like nothing changed. Like the same cells are coming through. They're just now on subscription. And uh, then like a week went by and it was still doing well. And then like a month went by and it's still doing well. We were like, is this like, when's this going to fall apart? Like, is this really working? And then like, all of a sudden we started to see like on the PL, how is it affecting things and the profitability and cash flow and being able to plan inventory, like all of these pieces. And now I would say, like, dude, like we are one hundred percent committed to subscription. Like if it can't somehow lead to a subscription, I'm like, don't want to direct resources to it. Um, and I realized like there's so much benefit to our customers for it. It sets them up in a better frame where they're con- they're considering taking the product more seriously being on subscription than when it's just like this one-off try it and and see what happens thing where people end up not do, taking it consistently so they don't get the result so then they don't actually like get the thing that they bought um and so i don't know there's a there's so many aspects to it but like having reoccurring revenue in any business model to me has become like the most paramount crucial thing one from a like yes building the brand but seeing on the back end how it affects like the finances and the, the like supply chain operations all of that stuff it's i mean it's like crucial 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 so that's amazing and it's isn't it crazy how like one little thing i mean it's not little but one change in your business can be the difference between maybe potentially you're not sitting here and being able to talk about the success of this company you do you take advice again from a mentor so i was talking to you and says come on if you don't have subscriptions you don't have a business and now look at you doing four hundred thousand dollars a month in subscription how many people i think over thirteen thousand subscribers yeah. or somewhere around yeah that? like we got to about like twelve thousand seven hundred drops a little bit and we're kind of scaling back up again now but um yeah i mean we do yeah we're doing it like we do about four hundred thousand in subscriptions a, a month and that's about forty percent of our, our revenue currently uh, or thirty to forty percent but that 30 to 40% is like 100% of our profit almost. Everything else, all the additional revenue on top of that, you know, getting us closer to like a million a month is is break even, going out to market, trying to get new customers, trying to like put our product out there and, and just trying to grow. But like the like bank account safe thing that we have is this like loyal customer base that's just building slowly in the subscription side, so... If you were to sit here and look at the business and say, you know what, 10 years from now, this is what success would look like. Mm-hmm. That might be tough and feel free to think on it. But what does that look like to you? 10 years from now, what does this business look like for you to be like, you know what, we succeeded? Yeah. To me, uh, it will not look like a business anymore. It'll like be a brand. Like It has to mean something more than the product we sell. And that's something that we've 
you know, spent a ton of time in the last year talking about is like, why are we even doing this? Like, what's the thing we're putting out beyond just selling someone creatine? Like, how are we changing people's lives with the identity side of what we're, we're selling and the identity piece of this? You know, you look at big brands like Nike or something like that. Like, there, there's something more than the shirt or more than the shoe. It's like the feeling, the identity piece that you get that that levels you up. Like, I remember when I played college basketball and, like, we got our jerseys and our shoes and everything, and it was, like, Nike gear and we had our Nike backpacks. Like, there was something that came with it because it was Nike and it wasn't, like, some off-brand that we had, like, in high school sports. And, like, that to me is really built what it'll look like to be successful in 10 years. I think in the shorter term, um, I think uh, creatine right now is like a revolution has begun. Uh, I think we've in many ways sparked that revolution. Like I'll openly take credit for it. Like the, you're seeing endless brands right now coming out with creatine, you know, sugar creatine gummies or different types of creatine. And uh, when we started this game like three years ago, you didn't see anyone talking about it online. Like it was a, it was still the most bought ergogenic supplement, but it was not spoke about it. it was no one was running ads to it it was just this this ingredient right and so uh there's a revolution though and the, i think it's growing because people are now realizing it's not just about building muscle it's not just for bodybuilders but it's really about performance across your every area of your life your mental performance your physical performance like even just your health and longevity and so i think we're kind of like trying to make sure that we capture as much of this like revolution as it creates and create that revolution like we have a mission to make creating a daily habit for a hundred thousand individuals i think really us doing that is creating it for probably millions of individuals because other companies are building off the back of like what we've started uh which is awesome and i think that's like the next one to three years is is going super hard down that path of of this creatine revolution and trying to really shift the way people see that product and and making it a daily performance uh habit and then I think we'll we'll continue to grow beyond that into just how do we improve people's performance in every area of their life, not just from supplements, but from something bigger that the brand provides. And I'll double down on that. I was an athlete like you, and I always thought creatine was just like, oh, I'm going to the gym. I gotta get I gotta get beefy for the mm-hmm. season. Like I'm gonna take creatine. That's what it's for. Yeah. Then now, like you said, over the last few years, it's come to light that this is a supplement that shouldn't be a daily thing that you yeah. incorporate because of all of these other benefits aside from maybe getting a little bit bigger in the gym. And it's funny, the main selling point back in the day or what people thought of is probably one of the most minor use cases for the actual product. Yeah. And you guys have set yourself up to capitalize off this huge educational boom. Yeah. Man, this, I take all these vitamins and all these different things and I drink my red, blue, green (laughs) juices in the morning this is actually a, a scalable because like some of these other things, man, I can't see how in the future people are going to take these 80 pills and all this crazy stuff. Creatine, simple scoop, some water, yeah. or just right down the hatch with a sip of water. Like that's something I can see being mainstream. Yeah. And I'm excited to get the chance to watch you guys continue to blow it up and, and really be the name in that yeah. space. Yeah. Some we say is, uh, kind of a joke is like meatheads have been the only ones smart enough to take creatine <laughs> and uh you know it's funny because you mentioned all these other like things that are hot right now like you talk about like shila g and sea moss and mm-hmm. and even like things like the biohacking world of like ice baths and saunas and all these things like that there's small amounts of research about the benefits of those things but there is an absurd amount of research when it comes to creatine and its impact. Like we're about to, me and my form, our formulator, we're about to release a book called the creatine code, diving into all of the research and all the benefits of creatine. Right. And, uh, that we're going to publish in the next probably two to three months. But like all of these biohacking things people are doing to get these like tiny micro improvements. And yet creatine has massive research showing its impact. And it's like, you're people are skipping such a simple way to get a huge improvement and skipping to all these like fancy crazy things of like oh i'm going to take this like random one herb that like i heard about on this thing or heard about on this podcast and i'm like okay do it cool go for it but start with the like foundational daily performance nutrient that's going to help all those things and, and kind of like set your base and so anyway that's the message we're trying to carry to the world is like do the thing that's going to make the most impact first and then 
feel free to go crazy. Like, go do all the biohacking you want. I like ice baths too, but yeah. <laughs> that's what, yeah, it's funny. Ice baths, it's like I I went back and forward with the guests on like the way the internet per- portrays it at the moment. You almost feel like you can't be successful unless you jump in cold <laughs> water every day, and yeah, yeah, that's hilarious. And it's just all great marketing. And oh, it's <laughs> the people marketing. that are selling ice baths are printing off of the back of somebody who buys it, does it for a week, and then never gets in again because it's not fun when it looks. Social media makes it look fun, like oh, I can take a video and give a motivational quote out. Yeah. Um. So we've gone through your whole journey here, the beginning stages, starting to get interested in business, taking a stab at it, and then officially going all in and building this eight-figure brand. I want to wrap up the conversation with what I would say is your newest venture, which is this personal brand that you're mm-hmm. now trying to build along with that. What sparked your interest to <laughs> start to really create a personal brand? And <clears throat> I know you're in your earlier stages. Have you already started to see value from that? Yeah, uh, that's such a good question. I am very early in it, like, and I've gone back and forth a hundred times of like, do I really want to have a personal brand? Do I not? Like, I've kind of started up at times, and uh, I think what's just finally sold me on it is I kind of get really frustrated to see people with, like, I'll even just stay in my own industry, people with supplement companies who are selling not very quality supplements they're they're full of sucralose or artificial you know uh vitamins and flavors and all of these different things like that they're using that are synthetic and it just drives me nuts to see them like blow up and and be like like the whole craze of virality that will come behind their product just because you know so and so is behind it or so and so started it and i'm like I, I've like wanted to fight that and be like, no, like you guys like like try and go to the market and be like, no, you need something that's quality, you need something that's pure, and and try and fight it with almost like uh, just brute force saying no, ours is better than theirs. And then I guess I've realized at some level, like I guess if we really are going to take this brand where I want, if we really are going to put out a quality product, and if I really do stand behind and believe what we're doing, I do need to get out there and personally stand behind it and personally build a brand. They can do what I'm seeing these other guys do, right? And so um, it's just kind of been a, a realization of I've seen the way people have been able to be, build big company brands or, or big products based on just simply their personal brand. I mean, we're staying at this hotel in Miami right now. It's uh, Dave Grutman's place. And truthfully, like not probably the nicest, coolest hotel yeah. like when we got there. And I'm like, we spent more than we probably would have spent on another hotel. Didn't even really look at it or look at the reviews just out of like, oh, but it's this guy's hotel. Like, that'll be cool. So that's really what sparked it was like realizing, hey, I do believe in the message we're putting out. I do believe in the products we're putting out. And if I'm really going to make the impact that we want to make with them, at some level, I got to just be out there more in the public. And I've seen it impact like in small ways. Like I don't have this huge following yet, but even, you know, the five, 10 people who will listen to a podcast and reach out to me after and be like, dude, like, you know, thanks for sharing your story or, Hey, like what product should I order? And I just message them back and forth on Instagram real quick. And it's like, I've seen those people stick around. I've seen those people be loyal. I've seen them be a part of our brand and, and be like ambassadors for what we're trying to build and what we're trying to create. And I, I see that like, even in the small scale, if I can just keep doing that and keep, uh, making like that small difference for a small group of people, that community is going to grow. And, and then we'll be able to make the larger impact that we're wanting to make as a, as a brand and me personally wanting to make in the world dude mic drop right there <laughs> mic drop at the end this has been a great conversation i've learned a lot <laughs> about creatine and, and this business and i think a lot of people listening i think like my audience is your target audience entrepreneurs now like biohacking getting in mm-hmm. shade taking care of yourself is is so modern anybody listening start with the simple product start with yeah. creatine it's easy to take it's gonna really benefit you in so many ways, not just getting beefy in the gym. So where can people go connect with you? What social media platforms are you most active on? Yeah. So I'm definitely most active on Instagram, Brave and Grant. Um, And then, you know, our company gains in bulk, you know, our, our thing that we've, you know, are known for is our instantized creatine because the first hundred percent soluble creatine monohydrate. So if you want to get some creatine, check out our instantized creatine. I tell everyone the same thing. I'm like, buy it take it every day for 30 days and just see what you think we have like a crazy return policy like it's like 60 or 90 days because we want people to someone to like take the whole thing 
see the impact of it. And if you don't love it, like send us the empty bag back and we'll refund it. Like it just rarely happens. So, um, yeah, like if you want to buy the product, gain some bulk and size creatine, or just hit me up on Instagram. I'm, I'm really active on, on Instagram and that's the main place. Like I have YouTube and TikTok and stuff, but Instagram is where I, I I'm like, I'm an old guy, I guess. So that's where it's been. My yeah, time. no worries. And all of that stuff will be linked in the bio below. I got to go and get uh, some creatine. I'm trying to get myself back in shape now. Yeah, we'll um, get you set up. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is a good timing for this conversation. Um, but again, thank you so much for making it happen. Thanks yeah. for popping in. I know you haven't been, you're not going to be in Miami for that long. So I appreciate you making that time. For sure. And I tell all of the individuals that I get to talk with, I'm now excited to personally know you and like, watch you continue to grow and blow this up and i hope i will get to say like creatine super mainstream 20 years from now i knew the individual yeah. blew it up he called it on my podcast yeah <laughs> and then when you get to a million a month we'll come we'll have you come back on the show 10 million a month while we come back on the show yeah. so again i can't thank you enough for making the time and and it's been a pleasure having this conversation awesome i appreciate it, andre